So my name is Rebecca Potter. I'm our team lead for uh, the health domain with DHIS2. And today we are having a series of presentations on impact and effective use of DHIS2. So what is effective use? This is actually a concept in uh, information systems literature. And so I had to uh, go to some colleagues for some help, but it's using a system in a way that helps attain the goals for using that system. Great definition, right? However, then I asked a few of my uh, PhD colleagues uh, who are, are quite smart ladies, and they told me this is about being able to use the system to its full potential according to the intention or targeting the use of the system for the purpose it is intended to do. The use is effective it's if it is contributing to the objectives of the organization by improving performance through efficacy and efficiency. So efficacy being, is it doing what it's supposed to do? And efficiency, are you doing it in the, the um, in a way that takes the least amount of resources possible. So thank you to Anna Torsing and Marta Lia for uh, helping me with that. And Gavi really pushed us this year to describe better how is DHIS2 actually contributing to health impact? Why does this matter? Why should we keep investing in this information system? Why do we keep investing in data? So it was a pretty big question. And so this, uh, this theory of change is actually borrowed from Gavi. They have a really great, great way of um, laying these things out where the inputs lead to their outputs, their outcomes, their impacts. And we spent some time uh, with his colleagues and others trying to figure out where does DHIS2 fit into all this? And we realized a lot of times when we tell our story, we're stopping at this bottom level, these inputs and activities. So what did we do? Who did we train? How many trainings? How many facilities? But that doesn't really tell us how is the system being used and what is it achieving? Then we looked at this sort of output level and we said, you know what, this is a bit of the sweet spot for, for DHIS2 interventions. These are the things where we can actually attribute change to DHIS2 and its presence and how it's being used. And then you keep going up these levels. So how does DHIS2 contribute to these outcomes? So looking at things like campaign coverage, campaign effectiveness, how is DHIS2 used to actually achieve that? And then you typically have your high level impacts, but that's a very difficult part to actually attribute change to DHIS2 because there are so many different factors, right? DHIS2 alone is not the one helping 90% of people living with HIV to become virally suppressed. It's just one part of that story. So these are a couple examples working with the Federal Ministry of Health, and we have these documented on our website as well, these impact stories. Um, but I really liked these because they gave us real numbers. Um, one example, we're talking about something very basic, basic aggregate monthly facility stock reports. And sometimes even the facilities were not entering them. Sometimes it was being entered at the LGA or district level. But these being scaled up throughout Nigeria and having the right people trained at the LGA level, it actually reduced the number of facility reported stockouts by 5,000%. So from 626 in 2021 compared to more than 30,000. So that means when children are going to these facilities, they actually have the vaccines there to get vaccinated. So this was a really great uh, story here. Um, and we looked at abstracts today where we could actually find numbers to, to attribute impact. Um, another one working with partners at Resolve to Save Lives, uh, they introduced the DHIS2 Android app for individual hypertension case management, and they use this at the point of care. So if we think about that cascade, what did they do? They introduced the tracker. That's just an activity. They had to train the 100 facilities and all these care providers. But what they did was actually reduce the waiting time for follow-up visits. They were able to digitize all this data. But then people at the facility use the working list, they use the individual level data to find all of the ones who were somehow missing, they were not going back to care. And then they actually relinked more than a thousand of these people back to care by following them up. And overall, they were able to increase the number of diagnosed patients, um, hypertension patients, by more than 50%. So we think that these digital interventions really do have a huge potential for change. And so I will hand over to my colleague who's joining us online, Patrick Omiel, and he's going to share a little bit more on the uh, topic of effective use um, by digging into the participatory design of EPI dashboards. So uh, Patrick, if you're online, the, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, can you hear me? Just confirm you can hear me. Loud and clear, yes. Thank you. Okay, let me just share my screen before I start. Um,
So, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, and thank you so much, uh, team, for being part of this uh, presentation, making time to be part of this session. Patrick Omiel is my name. I work with HISP Uganda, but I've also been part of the team that uh, works with uh, Rebecca's team at uh, the University of Oslo, uh, mainly supporting the configurations of metadata package for uh, the aggregate uh, domain. Yeah, so... Um, I'm basically here to share the work that uh, we've been doing uh, with the team of uh, colleagues, both at uh, HISP Uganda, but also at the Ministry of Health, uh, and of course at the University of Oslo, the, uh, the metadata package team. Yeah, so what, uh, we've, what we've been doing is uh, we came up with the idea of a participatory design for the EPI dashboard. And uh, this is not the first time we present this to this conference. This is the second time we're presenting to the conference. But uh, this time we are really sharing the uh, baseline assessment uh, that we did to try and understand the user experience um, uh, of uh, the experience of users uh, before we could make changes to the dashboard uh, using this participatory uh, design. So um, a bit of background here, uh, maybe just a quick outline of this presentation that I'll give a, a quick a background to uh, where this is coming from and also a quick highlight on um, uh, the approach that we're using to adopt these kits, uh, these toolkits in Uganda. And then uh, the purpose and objectives of the survey, the methods we used and the key findings uh, with the conclusion and recommendations that we came up with uh, learning from that baseline assessment. And then I would also share some screenshots of the dashboard and the designs that we came up with. And also to highlight a bit of the, uh, the impact uh, or the benefits that we're starting to see uh, with this design. So uh, for, uh, as a quick background, uh, this work comes from the, the work that uh, is being done uh, collaboratively with WHO and the HISP Center really to create this uh, toolkit uh, that we most of us actually know as metadata packages. Uh, and uh, with this new definition of toolkits, really it's looking at uh, a collection of resources that can support implementing DHIS2 uh, to meet a minimum uh, key functionality for a given use case. And the core for this is really the, uh, the, the metadata packages that uh, one can quickly install into a, a, a DHIS2 instance. And for long, we've always said that, you know, having this uh, standard design can actually help to promote uh, best practices, uh, disseminate standards, avoid duplication of efforts, and integrate um, uh, programs into HMIS, make sharing of data uh, easier and more efficient, and then also, of course, simplifies vertical reporting where there are global partners that may need data. And so far, we've seen uh, over 10 program areas being covered by these toolkits, and uh, over 64 countries have uh, adopted these toolkits. And uh, this is just a quick illustration, again, for people who are familiar with the, with the toolkit. We often talk about, use this slide to kind of show how it comes about, that uh, you have this guidance uh, that um, is globally generated. And out of that guidance that you, then another guidance is developed that can help with how data can be uh, analyzed and collected at a facility level. And it's based on that, that we're able to come up with this uh, toolkit that you can put in your DHIS2 and use it to collect data and be able to actually analyze your data. So for Uganda, we, um, and not only Uganda, for the countries that uh, are being supported by the HISP groups, uh, we get support from Gavi and the Global Fund to implement uh, these toolkits. Uh, and uh, for Uganda, we started way back in 2018 uh, with the approval of the Ministry of Health, we're able to do the TB, HIV and malaria uh, and of course the EPI, uh, but that's what we could do, making sure we're able to install the package uh, onto the national instance. But when we looked at the time, we realized that uh, the utilization of this, uh, this dashboards uh, and toolkits that we install, especially for the aggregate, that uh, it was really underutilized. And most times we realized later that, uh, you know, the training, the way we are rolling it out, um, the training wasn't so adequate, 
uh, most of the users weren't aware uh, and some of the critical analytics were lacking, especially for API. Uh, so this was the dashboard that uh, with the first design that uh, we installed, and this one came from the metadata package. Uh, so we installed this for Uganda uh, and that's really how it looked. Uh, but with that, people continue to make their own uh, analysis of uh, so what they will do, they go into DHIS2, even when they have that other dashboard, they still go ahead and do their own analysis. This is an example of a TB analysis that uh, was done by one of the districts. So they go extract the data from DHIS2 and still go ahead and do their plotting uh, on Excel and other tools offline. So we said maybe we need to do a better in how we design our, our dashboards uh, and also how we roll it out. So that's why we came up with that idea of a participatory uh, approach, uh, really to kind of readapt what we had because we have already we already had it installed, uh, and make it give it a new look, revamp it, and make it look better. And so we did a bit of a stakeholder engagement, a bit wider stakeholder engagement to basically review uh, what we had uh, set up on the national instance, uh, and then from there uh, the team basically generated new requirements and feedback for us to, to make uh, uh, refinements uh, to the dashboard. Uh, and so we went ahead uh, with this feedback um, and then the additional indicators that I'd also proposed and also utilize the latest features of DHIS2 uh, that had more analytics. Uh, and then we went and made these modifications. Uh, but this time we, we thought it would be wiser to, to actually first do a baseline assessment to understand uh, the experience uh, of the dashboard that was there before we could actually uh, bring in, roll out this uh, revised dashboard. Uh, and this is just a process that we're trying to use here where we are saying, if you have the dashboard, I mean the metadata package uh, set up, then you would have a joint review, uh, have a more deep dive into the indicator for everyone to appreciate the indicator uh, configurations uh, within the DHIS2, and then come up with these um, uh, areas of refinement and improvement. And this is now where we are, where, where we came up with the, with the baseline assessment. Uh, actually, we are now here because we've deployed, but what we are sharing is now on the baseline assessment. Really to understand what was there, how was it for you? How, how did you find it? And what can we make improvements on? Yeah, so we, we then went and had to do a baseline assessment and uh, the assessment objectives was really to, uh, to assess the user perception of uh, the appropriateness, uh, comprehensiveness, uh, the reliability, accessibility, uh, ease of uh, use, and capacity or training needs uh, for the existing dashboard. Yeah, really trying to look at what was there. Was it appropriate enough? Was it comprehensive? Was it reliable? And uh, these are just the other specifics that we looked at, uh, just breaking down what I've just mentioned. Uh, in terms of the appropriateness, the accessibility, and then the training and capacity building needs. Uh, so for this assessment, it was really a simple assessment, but uh, prospective in the sense that uh, we are starting the baseline and we are hoping to do um, uh, another post uh, implementation assessment. And again, it's not an experimental. We didn't really have like a control arm to say we are comparing those who not use the dashboard. We really looked at uh, those who are using the dashboard. And again, for the sampling, really it was purposive and drawing from uh, the respondents uh, who are really district and facility users that met the criteria uh, of active use of DHIS2. And then we, we use the tool that uh, we came up with and this tool we think going forward we could make further improvements, uh, but this tool can help with this assessment uh, that looks at effectiveness, an impact of DHIS tools uh, on users. Uh, and basically within the tools, we had both open-ended open -ended questions and structured questions. And for structured, most of them would look at like a, a five-point scale uh, just to assess the, the extent to which they agree uh, uh, with certain questions. And we did do uh, the assessment online just using Google Forms. Uh, that also helped us to get a bit of consent to consent the, uh, the participant. And then also, of course, uh, um, uh, have a bit of anonymity on the responses. So data that we, ex we collected, we exported into Excel, and uh, that's where we cleaned and need the analysis. 
So uh, this is just the key findings uh, that uh, starting with the profiles of our respondents, uh, we were able to reach out to 94 respondents and 48.6, uh, uh, and this covered 48.6 of the districts of uh, in Uganda and 84% uh, of the respondents were really the district biostatistician. Uh, these are the, the people who are responsible for coordinating reporting at the district, but also of course coordinating uh, reporting within facilities within their district. So they are like the people who interact with the DHIS2 in Uganda on a day to day basis. So they were really the critical people uh, to give us uh, feedback uh, on what was going on. And so the first key area of assessment was on whether the dashboard, the existing dashboard was appropriate. Or, uh, or comprehensive really in measuring coverage for the EPI coverage is very key uh, for dropout rate. Um, and then of course, adverse event following immunization, cold chain, and then stock and wastage. So those were these five areas that we're looking at in terms of uh, uh, the comprehensiveness and whether uh, the, dashboard was, uh, the dashboard was able to appropriately uh, uh, measure these uh, areas. Uh, and you could see that uh, the highest agreement was, was with coverage. Uh, and again, for Uganda coverage at district level, um, the indicators, the denominators is well set out. So this is not surprising that 71 of them concurred that the dashboard was able to uh, comprehensively uh, uh, measure and help them analyze coverage. Uh, of course, you also followed uh, by dropout um, at 67 and at adverse event following immunization. And the list was really on stock and stock and cold chain at uh, both doing 55% agreeing. Uh, and agreeing really we're looking at those who strongly agreed and those who agreed anyone neutral and below, uh, we're not counting on, on this. So it was clear to us that uh, the dashboard would, uh, can appropriately actually um, uh, measure coverage, dropout rate, but with a list on the cold chain and the stock, um, yeah, and then uh, we also looked at uh, the reliability and timeliness, uh, whether the dashboard is able to reliably um, uh, analyze data and, 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 and also, of course, in a timely fashion. Uh, and again, 72% agreed to that. Uh, but of course, there are those who disagreed, the 28%. And of course, they had concerns of training, concerns of internet, missing analysis. And of course, the understanding of the indicators. And you are going to see some of this resounding as I, I go through the, uh, uh, the findings. Then we also looked at accessibility and ease of use. Um, and the first one you're looking at is ease of access, uh, ease of learning, ease of navigation, and of course, availability of uh, the user manuals. Uh, and again, we had the highest agreement um, on access. Uh, most of them agreed that they can easily access the, the system and the dashboard. Uh, and of course, they also felt it was easy to learn um, how to navigate and use the dashboard. Um, and then the list was, of course, the user, user manual. They indicated that uh, user manual is not available. And again, as we go through the challenges, uh, they indicated that they actually wanted printed kind of uh, manual so that uh, it's easy for them to refer to it. We also looked at training and uh, for training and capacity building, 65% of them um, agreed that had received training on DHIS2. Uh, and, they, and again, this was more like looking at DHIS2 for the training uh, because we had limited training specific on the dashboard, but generally for DHIS2 training, 65% concurred. And 67% uh, uh, indicated that they felt that the training was adequate. But they also, of course, highlight areas, like the highlighted areas um, uh, of need, especially around interpretation, data extraction. Uh, they wanted more training on indicators, the new features of DHIS2, and also if we can, they can be trained on customization and design. And they largely emphasize that the training should be hands-on and practical. Yeah. Then the other one we looked at is uh, frequency of access. We also wanted to know how frequent do they access the, uh, uh, the DHIS2. And uh, we see 87% of them indicated, yes, they have uh, frequent, they always and often uh, access the, this, this, this dashboard. Uh, but it was surprising that about 57% of those, the about 13% uh, that uh, 
were not um, that rarely uh, or sometimes or never access the dashboard. Some of them were really by statisticians, a bit surprising, and yet these guys are really key. But again, it's a very small number if you looked at 13% of uh, the, the 94. Yeah, and again, some of the reasons they were giving is still around training, the felt that the dashboards are a bit cluttered, so it's hard to find what you need. Uh, they had issues of internet connectivity uh, and then lack of access. Um, yeah, yeah, those are the issues that were raised by those who are if infrequently uh, accessing the dashboard. And then the last part on this is really, um, we also interested in understanding the time it takes them to, to extract relevant information from the dashboard. Uh, and again, we here we see about 55 um, uh, percent uh, indicated they could do this in less than 10 minutes and about 82 in um, less than 15. And of course, the uh, the 18 percent would go over 15 minutes. And again, they had some concerns of slow internet and clear indicators and confusion on the dashboard. So, and there are a lot of challenges that were we picked, and we're not going to go under each of them, but we've tried to kind of uh, 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 group them. Uh, the first one we looked at, uh, we grouped it to be really issues around design and uh, functionality, uh, stability of the system, performance, and then accessibility, accessibility, training, capacity building, the end user support, uh, then the data extraction, uh, quality, both on data and metadata, and then analysis, and then lastly, on system integration. And uh, again, if you look at just, I'll just pick a few, if you look at uh, on the design, the dashboard, the clutter of the dashboard again comes here. They feel, they feel that the, 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 the dashboard is usually congested, so it's not easy for them to quickly pick out what they need. Um, yeah, and, they, and this is almost the same thing that is difficult in finding specific information. Uh, if you come here and system stability, they indicated the system sometimes on and off. Uh, and then um, the network, network keeps coming here, yeah? Uh, and then here, lack of training for facility uh, staff uh, in analysis. And I think this is something that most of us must be aware of, that most trainings really don't go down to facility level. They again raise the issue of lack of hard copy user manuals. Um, and then down here, issues of extraction. Uh, they have difficulties in extracting data into Excel. Um, then they also indicated that data elements are not clearly visible. And then for integration, they also indicated the, um, that there are multiple logins and they feel this is an issue of integration. They also, based on those, they also indicated areas of improvement, which again, we will not have time to go under each of them, uh, but we've also grouped them in the same way, really around those same areas. The good thing they will have the challenges, but they also propose for us uh, some of the, uh, the areas for improvement. Uh, and I will not, due to time, I will not go under each of them. We will share this presentation. Yeah. yeah. So for us, again, in conclusion, we think that uh, uh, based on what I've highlighted, and again, we have a detailed report for this, uh, that uh, the findings really underscore the strength of the existing EPI dashboard. Uh, in all areas of assessment, uh, but while also emphasizing the need to address uh, the concerns around the stability of the system that they, they mentioned, uh, the dashboard design and features, and it's also critical to enhance, um, and it's critical to enhance, of course, the user experience and provide additional training opportunities to meet the needs of the users and, and then maximize the effectiveness of this dashboard. Uh, so key recommendations that we, we draw from this assessment uh, is one is to, we need to really address uh, the concerns of internet. Uh, we know that uh, uh, for countries like Uganda, efforts have been made to improve on internet connectivity at uh, district and facility levels. Uh, but again, all these facilities at different level. At hospital, definitely to be much better. But as you go to a health center too, uh, there, will be, there will be definitely issues of connectivity. And same things with the district. We have newer districts that uh, the infrastructure, not just for internet, but also even for the other areas, you find uh, it's a bit lacking. So, um, but however, the focus on addressing the internet is really uh, very important. Uh, we also need to kind of help users understand uh, that connectivity uh, is not, um, 
and inherent uh, flaws in the, in the software because um, when people fail to access the system for some reasons of in internet or some connectivity, sometimes they say DHIS is not working. Yeah, so it's very important that uh, we help them to understand that um, if you have issues of internet, then it's internet, not DHIS too. Uh, we also um, recommend that uh, we need to provide training uh, to facility users uh, to ensure that they equally have uh, the necessary knowledge uh, to use the system. And this is very important because most times when we do training, kind of ends at district level and we let the district people uh, take it down, but most times they don't have resources to, to actually uh, do this training at those levels. We also think that it's important to have regular train, advanced training for district uh, users, because most times we're really focusing them on uh, how do you analyze data, but sometimes they're interested in how do I configure my indicators and be able to analyze uh, data. Um, and then we also recommend that um, um, it's important for these actions, uh, I mean, for these, um, uh, for these recommendations uh, that we've come up with and the challenges uh, and the areas of improvement that they have uh, suggested uh, that we really incorporate this in our design uh, to further enhance uh, the EPI dashboard and of course the entire DHIS2 uh, implementation. Um, and then also, uh, this was mentioned by Rebecca, uh, really need to enhance the project designs for digital interventions uh, by uh, incorporating a robust system of, um, of M&E uh, framework uh, to set benchmarks for this kind of evaluations. Uh, as you realize that uh, we try to come up with some benchmarks to, to assess, but I think when we, we improve on that, then it will be very easy for us to clearly benchmark and then do these uh, evaluations and see if there's impact. Um, so uh, I think I'm done with those. So I'm just going to take you through some of what we have. Uh, so for the dashboard, uh, what we've been able to do, uh, first it covers these areas, uh, coverage, dropout rate, uh, wastage monitoring, availability of vaccines and supply, cold chain, adverse event following immunization, and then session planning, which is really uh, what comes with the guidance yeah, uh, for, for EPI facility and district level analysis. But also with the new features of DHIS, we've been, we've been able to implement uh, this uh, red, what we call reaching every district categorization. We are now able to do monitoring charts. And also uh, we brought in the coverage time uh, that was not part of um, uh, the existing dashboard. And this one is able to help monitor stock adequacy. So for the red categorization, we are now able to implement this uh, nice cutter plot and then be able to categorize um, districts or you could even do it for facilities, but because of challenges of coverage doesn't really work at that level. But at district level, you can know which uh, districts fall in which category. And we're not going to go through each of these but uh, you can clearly see uh, uh, with this uh, scatter plot, we have these quadrants. Uh, again, for now, we are not able to shade it. So we'd say, no, this may be difficult. So what we did, we said, let's do it in a map so that uh, instead of using these different uh, quadrants here with this scatter plot, we now have it in a map. So here one can clearly see uh, which district is on red and we know where what red means by the different categories for, uh, for this red categorization, uh, yellow, light green, and green. So we went further again to also bring in uh, a pivot table uh, that can actually help those who would want to see more months to see if there's been trends of, uh, uh, of this kind of uh, performance for a given uh, district. Yeah, so this is one of the things that was lacking, but now we can have this in the DHIS too. And then we also did the, the monitoring chart where you can have your population. And then as uh, vaccination happens, uh, you're able to, on a monthly basis, when they report, it's able to plot and show you whether you are, uh, you're meeting your, your required monthly targets uh, based on your population estimates. Uh, we are also able to do uh, the, uh, the stock adequacy based on the stock coverage. So you can really clearly see Again, which district is out of stock, which district is understocked, which district has adequate stock, and which one is overstocked. Uh, and again, this is uh, data from, uh, I would say, sample data, but uh, near, near real. 
uh, that can clearly see anyone maybe going out of the field, say these districts are in red, they are out of stock. Uh, these districts are in yellow and are stocked. Uh, you could also bring in all the coverage in one table and have all these nice uh, colors uh, so that you can see which antigen has low coverage uh, for which period. Uh, we also, of course, brought this dual chart uh, for session planning, where you can look at uh, uh, the sessions conducted uh, uh, versus the proportion of those uh, the, uh, those that were yeah planned versus the proportion of those that were done, and you're able to look at that in one chart. Uh, and then you can also look at wastage, and uh, also use on use these legend colors to really highlight those that are maybe uh, high. And then we also brought in the uh, uh, the spider chart where you can uh, do multiple coverage for uh, indicators and compare one year with another, and then be able to, of course, put your uh, kind of uh, the target line. Uh, and you can see for this one in the first year, in last year, they were able to hit it. This year, they are still trying to get there. We are just half the year, but one can see that if you are 23, at 33%, will you get to 100%? Yeah, but it helps to compare the, the current year and the previous year. Uh, and lastly, so, so, so far what we are, we are starting to, to see, and when we do the uh, another assessment uh, in the next uh, few months, uh, we should be able to properly document some of the impact that uh, this has had in, uh, in for the users in terms of using the system but also, of course, take it to the next level of understanding if this is really able to uh, contribute to the health outcomes. So, of course, with this dashboard on the national instance, it's a national reach. We're able to get to 5,000 users because you have shared it with everyone. Yeah. Uh, and of course, with the facilities that are in the DHS2 instance, we're about 8,000 and uh, the 146 districts. So, that's the kind of reach this uh, dashboard is able to cover, meaning that any user with access should be able to access this dashboard. However, uh, with the viewership, which is also good, which has made some improvement. Uh, of course, if you look at these users, 5,000, you expect all of them to view the dashboard, but it's not the case. Yeah, But we are seeing there's improvement in, in viewership of this dashboard. And this, we use the analytics, uh, the usage analytics on DHIS2. Uh, and when we extracted this data, uh, in, we looked at data of 2021, before we, we could uh, make these changes. In the whole quarter average, averagely 10 people would look at that dashboard for the, the, the EPI. But now in 2022, when we started making these changes and talking about this dashboard, we're seeing the, uh, the, the viewership is going to 50 uh, per quarter. Again, that's still low. And this is now, and this year, it's about 61 averagely a view. Some months have spikes, uh, but we think that already coming from 10 to 50 to 60 is something. Uh, we are also uh, uh, hearing that, uh, that uh, the, the stock adequacy um, is now helping uh, for, with better uh, understanding of stock uh, adequacy for the different districts and facility level. If you looked at the map that I shared early, um, analysis like grade categorization um, and the monitoring chart has also made it easier. Uh, because previously we had this in separate app, uh, the immunization analysis app, but now we have it onto the dashboard. So it makes analysis much easier. We're also seeing increase, uh, increased demand uh, uh, for lower, lower level um, uh, subnational analysis. Uh, most of the biostatisticians are very interested in doing analysis at facility level or uh, sub county level because they feel well, they, they, if they're within their district, how can they understand the coverage within their district? And so we've had this demand on catchment area. Uh, and again, with the, with, the, with the recent development around the maps, we think we can also improve on that. Yeah, but this is also just a kind of testimony that was coming from the data manager, the EPI, who has been very, very keen and working with us on this dashboard. Yeah, so he was able to say that, you know, we always uh, have weekly, uh, program meetings where we present uh, the program performance using the dashboard. So already they're using this because um, again, if you looked at the map of stock uh, coverage or stock adequacy, uh, if you present that every Monday or every end of the month once the data, 
has already been entered, then it's, it's quite informative. One can know where the problems are. Thank you, Patrick, so much. We're going to have to, I know this is your last slide. Uh, we're a little over time. So um, maybe you can yes. show us the uh, acknowledgements and, and we'll introduce our next pre presenter. Thanks. Yes, so that is really the acknowledgement. And thank you so much. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so very much. So our next presentation, it will be a joint presentation um, from Adolf Komagunga and Wilfred Senyoni. So from his Rwanda and his Tanzania, respectively. Um, like to come on up and start us off, Adolf. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, just going to simply take you through or share with you our experience, uh, trying to enhance data use at uh, decentralized levels, especially uh, uh, trying to use to adopt the strategy of having a district of excellency. This is uh, an approach whereby after realizing that at district level, there is a very big gap on using data DHIS analytics apps to analyze data at the centralized levels and also to use data. So then we, we've been doing this uh, exercise together with our uh, HISP sisters in Tanzania, uh, especially uh, exploring different options, but mainly uh, in our country, uh, we've been uh, uh, using this or trying this uh, using scorecard and also using enhanced dashboards. In my presentation, I'm going to simply uh, uh, give you an overview of what we've done with this district of excellency, uh, trying to describe uh, the use case and some of the achievements of the implementation and also some uh, conclusion based on uh, how we've seen this. Uh, this is uh, just to briefly uh, uh, illustrate uh, how our district of excellence works. Uh, the aim of this, as I said, is to strengthen data use at uh, pilot sites, because after finding that in some of most of the district level, facility level, data use is still a challenge. So we, we, we use this district of excellence to try to identify the gaps, but also uh, use those pilot uh, districts to see what is working, what is not working, what are the challenges, I try to address and replicate uh, what we we found working to the rest of the other districts of the country. Of course, uh, at district level, uh, you find the coordination meetings. Uh, these are uh, the meetings that are happening mainly on at district level, at the uh, district, uh, district, uh, district, uh, district level, simply to uh, coordinate the health interventions but also to monitor her status depending on priority indicators by district. Uh, in most of the cases, you find the countries, uh, uh, we are much focusing on national priority indicators. And we, to some extent, we forget to really support district level where data is being collected and where it, it is supposed to be uh, also used to inform or to improve health services. Uh, uh, during this district of excellence exercise, Part of the task is also to assess the gap, uh, try to see uh, what are the standards being used, what are the operations, and also what are the procedures in place to, uh, and even the gap with that uh, SOPs, uh, so that as we improve our SOPs, as we uh, we we found out something, so that we can to, to to also to adjust a little bit to the SOPs, especially to improve. Uh, uh, data use at the centralized levels. 
part of this also that uh, uh, this street of excellency is to address challenges, but also document. So by uh, looking how districts are using data at their level, uh, by trying to find out the gap, by trying to find the, ch the challenges, but also trying to document so that uh, the, the whatever is working on well, we try to, we can replicate it elsewhere. Whatever is not working, we try to re-engineer or, or readjust to, uh, to come up with a documentation and publication, especially uh, uh, trying to uh, combine uh, this uh, implementation research so that whatever is being implemented, whatever is being uh, done at the street level, uh, uh, of course, as a organization that working with academic institutions, trying to work with the master students, uh, to or help us to dig in and uh, uh, found the challenges, but also document uh, uh, for 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 the community. This is in summary what we we've been doing in the in our district of excellency uh, to be able to address uh, data use gaps, but also uh, copy and paste what is working well in this uh, pilot uh, districts. So as I said, uh, we, we have a number of different use cases, but for the sake of this presentation, I'll be focusing on only how we, we, we through this district of excellency, uh, of course, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and other departments, uh, the use of scorecards and dashboards at the district level, in the recordation meetings, district health management meetings, and also a number of different meetings at the health facility, especially dis discussing, you know, at uh, the health facility, they might have uh, uh, different coordination, uh, the, uh, data quality meetings, uh, staff meetings, coordination meetings. So in those meetings, we want to see how data is being used, how data informs the planning and the presentations and the sessions, how data is being used to, uh, uh, to inform uh, the next uh, actions. So we started by evaluating uh, and also documenting the process. Of course, uh, talking about there is a gap in data use doesn't mean like nothing is being done, but we wanted simply to see how is it being done and what are the gaps in that process, what are the gaps in terms of uh, documentations, and also uh, the challenges to for data use at those levels. Uh, then together, uh, we work with them to configure the scorecards and also dashboards based on their priority indicators and also, uh, of course, uh, national indicators, but also focusing mainly on, uh, on their uh, uh, needs, because sometimes we tend to forget uh, data needs at the central levels. We have also been participating uh, in monthly and quarterly coordination meeting in those pilot sites just to see, to be able to experience uh, uh, things rather than, rather than reading from the reports, the uh, session reports, so that we can really feel uh, uh, their concern and also uh, exchange hand to hand for us to be able to standardize or to advise and standardize the, the approach in the other DC. So for this exercise, we, we, in our district of excellency, we actually using one district in the urban area and one district in the rural areas. After that, uh, after participating the meetings and also attending the coordination meetings, uh, we, we, we've done some assessment, especially uh, look, uh, uh, looking from the uh, how things are being done uh, and how the meetings are being organized, what are the facts presented. Then we document for, for further use and also for replication. Uh, we have also uh, uh, champions the, the supervision approach so that uh, district, uh, so as we are meeting district, so district is supposed also to go down to the health facilities to see uh, whatever we are discussing 
how is it being done so that as we address one level, but also when, uh, as we address the challenge, we, are, we not address on the district level only, but also addressing the whole or covered area by the district. So that as we improve data use, uh, we not focus on at the seat level, but also we go deep to the facility so that uh, uh, data can be at the center of every uh, uh, coordination meetings, uh, district management meetings, and also uh, data management meetings that are happening at his facilities. So what we simply uh, did for, for with the, together with the district people is to improve uh, how DHIS is being configured for them to, visual, to be able to, be, to, visual, to visualize key performance indicators within a district. So we, we normally had uh, this process of only customizing dashboards for the national use. Uh, uh, but we thought, how, why don't we go down and this, the customize this uh, dashboard for and scorecard for, for, for districts? Of course, involving stakeholders, it means like the head of uh, the, the head of institutions, the head of the, the director of health in the, at the district hospital, at the administrative districts, and all stakeholders that are sitting in this uh, uh, district level coordination meetings. Exploiting the, the, the scorecard. Uh, as uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows how the scorecard works, but the scorecard offers possibilities of having tabular uh, uh, features for you to, with a color coding style for, for whoever to be able to identify easily the, the bottlenecks or the area with problems, the performing indicators and non-performing indicators, and my, many uh, options. Part of the exercise, uh, of course, uh, with the Working with the way with the district people, it becomes like a peer learning process, whereby as we do, they also learn how to do things. This means like also decentralized to a certain extent, uh, uh, that capabilities of doing things by themselves. This has informed uh, the action such as I said, uh, whereby throughout the collaboration with the local universities and the UIO students uh, to carry out implementation research on all this so that we can easily find out what are the, the challenges with data use at the centralized levels and also document the lesson learned. Uh, this is one of uh, uh, a sample of one, the, one of the configuration for the scorecard. Uh, for you to have a look, for example, taking an example here, you can see uh, with the scorecard, you can easily configure uh, legends based on how you want and also based on the score uh, for example here we uh, this is a sample of a scorecard for the epi program whereby we want to see uh, uh, we wanted to have a scorecard for a dhm team meeting coordination meeting to be able to see how uh, api indicators are performing using different uh, different uh, data sources especially denominators here we want to there's one indicator looking at uh, BCG as denominator, but also use uh, another proxy indicators using CSAS data, so that as they are trying to interpret the performance indicators, they are also comparing uh, uh, use of different denominator source because it also uh, sometimes uh, uh, contribute to whether you can think you are much progressing or you are not performing while maybe there's denominator issue. This is about the results, of course. Uh, uh, this is about the results. Uh, one of the results out of this exercise is to have the district, uh, district level staff capacitated to do this by themselves, but also, but, but also uh, promoting data use at the uh, ground level uh, uh, so, so that maybe they don't feel like they have to send data to, uh, to the national level, but also see how they can use data by themselves also uh the one of the lessons to have the regional collaboration because this this app has been developed by the university you no know, by the our colleagues from his tanzania so it it also helped to be like uh, a way of contributing to the regional uh innovation 
uh, providing feedbacks to improve the app for the rest of the community. I can't read everything as uh, uh, I've been told uh, the time is running so fast, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, as a conclusion, data use, it, is it used to be a, a challenge and it is still a challenge to some of the districts, but having a system itself is not enough to say that data is being used at, uh, at all levels. So people have to know how to use uh, this, this available information because as data are being collected at the ground level, so, but sometimes much uh, less efforts are being uh, given to, uh, to how to explore that, uh, that tool. And also the access level of people down there is not really, uh, uh, is not really well configured to support that at this at the centralized levels. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, the, 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 the district of excellency helps to you to see what is working well from the selected district and to, for you to be able to replicate. Sometimes we assume uh, the way we do things might be the best way, but using this district of excellency has proved to us that there are a lot of we can improve by testing some of the approach in some selected districts and replicate when we are quite sure of what is uh, of what is uh, uh, working well and also uh, support documentation uh, sorry for, for 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 rushing because uh, i've been told that the time is running is too small and there are a lot of presentation to be done so the powerpoint is shared on the i think will be shared uh, on the, the drive and uh, the video is going to be shot so you can still have a look and reach out to us in case you need to find out more. Thank you very much. So next we have um, online actually Wilfred Sanyoni. So Wilfred, do you want me to pull yours over or do you want to present on your own? Hi, Rebecca. Can you hear me there? Yes, we hear you. Oh, great. So just a minute. And Uh, you need to, um, I think you're still projecting your screen. So I'm going to give you an just... Okay, is my screen, uh, can you see my screen there? Perfect, yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Wolfred Signoni uh, from uh, His Tanzania. Uh, based in Tanzania. I'm here to present um, a local project that we have championed uh, at the HIPS Tanzania, but also working with the HIPS Center, but uh, with the Ministry of Health. Uh, this project aims at enhancing the data availability and use at the local level, um, and in particular at health facilities. So this particular project was made possible through the implementation of the District of Excellency um, in some of the sites in Tanzania. So um, I think my colleague have just gone through and explained us a little bit about um, uh, what is a digital excellency, but basically, but in its context, digital excellency just provide a learning environment where um, certain uh, solutions such as approaches and technologies can be collaborated, uh, developed, tested, and you know, for improved processes of monitoring, evaluation, and learning. So the key point is that, you know, um, uh, these particular spaces, um, um, allows um, different stakeholders to come together and work together and test out the solution which is there. And this solution could be digital, uh, or it could be routines, could be structured, could be kind of approaches, or, or at least business processes that could actually improve um, efficiency of data use, uh, data management, and etc. I think uh, Rebecca touched a little bit about that uh, in the beginning. 
So why do we need um, a digital of excellence? So I think that the, the most important part is, you know, to have a, a safe environment where um, stakeholders can come together, test some solutions, um, understand what works, what doesn't work, and, and if it works for whom and it doesn't work, why does it not work, you know? And then after that, kind of see how you can scale also some of the solutions uh, from one side to another. Uh, additionally, of course, uh, digital of excellence provide a, a, an environment where you can actually generate more champions of the system, uh, which can be used in terms of scaling this system into a, a broad aspect. As we all know, uh, health information systems uh, implementation requires some champions who could actually um, help in terms of sustaining and scaling the system um, across the country, but also reach out. But of course, uh, digital excellence provide also a platform where researchers and implementers could come together, work together, uh, uh, learn and, and feed in from the research, the, the knowledge which is generated from research could actually feed into the implementation, go implementation, vice versa to the um, 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 research. Mm -hmm. So the District of Excellence in Tanzania, we have implemented it in um, um, two designated districts in the Doma region. The Doma region is the uh, one of the is the capital city or uh, capital region uh, in Tanzania, uh, situated there, um, sandwiched between several national parks, as you can see there. Um, we selected two district councils. Uh, one is by district council, and the other one is the uh, Dodoma City Council. So one district council provided a little bit of a, a context of the urban, while the other one was providing a, a, a rural setting. The idea was, you know, kind of uh, to learn from um, some of the local initiative which was uh, ongoing in one particular council and see how we can scale it to other uh, council and then understand the practice of scaling these particular practices and then, of course, uh, documenting these uh, practices and also hopefully scaling it uh, uh, nationwide. Of course, uh, by having two district councils, as, as you see, it provides also a, me a means of testing the solution and also kind of compare uh, knowledge which you can gain from uh, different settings which, which you have from the rural and from the urban as well. So our methodology was um, a little bit um, uh, straightforward. Uh, one, we tried to kind of focus our own um, um, district of excellency approach in terms of four thematic areas. That is one we needed to focus on data management and information use, how data management information use is kind of um, cultivated within the local means and how can this be scaled. Um, the second part was more or less how can the digital innovation, digital tools could actually facilitate or help um, enhance data use at the local, at, at a local level. And then, of course, uh, the third part was more or less on the capacity development. How can we build an uh, adequate capacity, build the champions who could actually take up the system and, of course, um, 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 work with that. Of course, the fourth part was the research and documentation in terms of uh, working with the um, um, local universities, uh, but also international as well, um, postgraduate students, undergraduate students, and see how we can um, conduct some research. Um, action research in the ground, but also feeding this actual research into um, best practices and also share this best practice community. Uh, before starting, we decided to kind of conduct a baseline study. I think my colleagues also, uh, some of my colleagues have talked about base, uh, baseline uh, studies. Ours, we decided before we embark on any interventions, uh, we might need to kind of understand uh, the local context in terms of understanding the formal and formal, and also what kind of improvisation is required in terms of uh, enhancing the process of managing routine data within this particular um, um, two sites which we have. Um, ideal is that the baseline uh, assessment would be now providing us with answers and also now work together with the local um, uh, stakeholders in terms of uh, developing now these uh, interventions which we want to work um, within this particular district of excellence. But the key part also is that these interventions need not to be parallel, but rather building on top of the existing uh, practice and routines in terms of that analysis that are used, um, and et cetera. So these are some of the um, findings um, which we got from the baseline uh, assessment, which we, that we have done. The report can be found, of course, online. Uh, we are happy to share the report. Um, there are key areas which we did uh, uh, assessment, and we were looking more uh, at the level, district level, facility level, and we find some, um, you know, strength, some of the strengths, some of the weaknesses which could actually provided us with an opportunity to kind of now shape our intervention. For example, we found that there were already some champions 
um, who are there who are understanding the systems, who have been using the tools and et cetera. We have found also there was a kind of a knowledge in terms of analyzing data, which is, which is there. However, we also found some um, um, weakness in terms of you know, skill set, uh, in terms of using DHS2 to analyze and integration. And most of it is, was more or less at the facility level, where they were all mostly thinking of reporting this data rather than using them for the local um, 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 uh, management. Of course, uh, the other part we also found was you know, shortage of forums and um, platforms where they could actually, um, you know, talk, analyze data, engage with the data, and also uh, interpret their data and, and make sense of their data. And, and of course, lack of standards in terms of how do you analyze your data? How do you manage your indicators? How do you uh, disseminate your information to different stakeholders which you have within the district? And of course, within the facility. There are a lot of course, uh, different opportunities. For example, you know, the DHS2 has now been scaled to the health facility. So now the health facility can actually um, um, are able to, to do most of these um, um, decision-making uh, processes at their particular uh, level. So that was on the that analysis and uh, presentation, but also we, we looked about, you know, on the information use culture, you know, uh, what are their strengths? Of course, there are kind of uh, um, good opportunities which we saw there. Uh, one was, you know, we have these quarter review meetings, uh, which have been um, happening quarterly, not quite routine, but at least there were some kind of um, um, institutional practice, which is there in terms of, you know, what needs to be done, who's engaged, um, for how frequently are you going to do this, and etc. Of course, the challenge of um, funding was always there in terms of limiting these particular meetings um, to, 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 to be executed, but also the standards. Uh, we found that there was no common standard between these districts in terms of how they are using these quarter review meetings to actually use the data and influence the decision which is made in this particular quarterly review uh, uh, meetings, which is there. So those are kind of, uh, you know, aspects which we saw in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the need of having more standardized way, uh, but also as well as, you know, uh, build this culture so that, you know, not only the district people will be managing and, and supporting the data analysis, but also the facility now owning the data and using this and analyzing the data and using that for um, um for, for decision making yes on the general health data management uh, we found also there there are some strength there uh, good structures in terms of how they're managing the uh, hms tools um, ICT literacy, there was a good um, um, a command on that, on that on some level, I think on most on the district level, uh, fair level skills on use of, you know, data tools and et cetera, uh, but also uh, availability of experienced staff in, in service provisions. Um, however, of course, there's a, 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 some of them who were lack, lack, lack of training, of course, uh, lack of, of course, a continuation. If you're trained um, today, uh, I think the last training was like three, four years ago. So there was a really kind of lack of continuation in terms of this uh, on-site job uh, training uh, in that particular uh, location. Of course, there was also lack of framework to enhance the use of data to inform decisions once uh, they, are, they are there. So there is a lot of kind of findings which we kind of got from the baseline assessment. Um, once we conducted this assessment, we kind of sat down with the uh, districts and verify that. And of course, later on, we kind of now divine, design an uh, action plan uh, with uh, agreed interventions. Um, the first point we saw that there is a need to kind of improve or enhance the analysis of uh, data at the facility level. And one of the uh, barriers which we saw was the lack of denominators uh, at the health facility. And I think this is kind of a a problem which um, uh, faces a lot of uh, health information systems. Um, and luckily we had kind of a local remedy in terms of how one champion was creating these uh, denominator health facilities. So we were trying now to see uh, how can we map this particular solution uh, from the rural setting to the urban setting where we have different level of facilities uh, compared to what we have in the, uh, in the rural setting. So that was kind of the first kind of way in terms of addressing it and so that health facility could actually now have these targets and also compare themselves across. Uh, the second part was now to kind of um, develop together um, the health facility and district level dashboard uh, based on their local needs. Um, they came up with their indicators. These are the indicators we want to monitor every month. These are kind of the targets which we, 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 we have. These are kind of um, 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 uh, areas which we want to really kind of monitor through our, our program and different programs. 
So we start with them and design a little bit of uh, facility level um, and district level dashboard um, with them. And then, of course, I uh, share with them for, for particular testing. Uh, we also went ahead and build capacity to the local user, focusing more on the data management, data quality analysis, um, dissemination and use, because this is one of the huge gap which we saw in terms of, you know, uh, most of these, uh, I think Patrick also mentioned this, most of these uh, digital tools uh, or apps which we are actually building uh, within, within this uh, health information system, we are actually deploying them at the national level. However, the user at the local level are not really using these particular um, uh, tools. And of course, it because one could be, of course, a uh, need of awareness, but also uh, maybe they don't have the capacity to use that. So we kind of train them in terms of uh, understanding uh, these tools, use them to interpret their data, understand the quality of their data, and et cetera. And it was quite, quite informative in terms of the way um, they use these uh, particular tools to really go down and, uh, and look at their data uh, and talk, you know, as colleagues, you know, kind of what, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, and how can you address these particular challenges which they are seeing. So it was quite um, a good platform in terms of um, engaging. And, and of course, following that, we saw that there was really a need to kind of uh, introduce more routines um, or platform where these guys could actually come together, sit and discuss, uh, engage, discuss, interpret their data and make decision out of their data. And this particular meeting should be now embedded within these quality, uh, sort of quarterly review meetings, which they, are, they usually have and which are kind of uh, something which uh, uh, they, they kind of institutionalize within their, their structures. So those were kind of some of the interventions which we thought, of course, uh, as we continue, we are looking forward in terms of how can we improve more. Uh, for example, we, we understand that the Minister of Health in Tanzania have designed, um, developed a, a data use guideline, uh, which covers different levels with uh, national, region, district, and facility. And some of these guidelines, we are trying to see how we can also introduce it within the district test them and also see how it works and also provide feedback for the ministry to see how they can improve uh, these particular um, guidelines. So um, preliminary findings, uh, these are things which we have kind of um, deployed recently. Um, these some of these interventions. Um, of course, what we have seen now is that, you know, um, some of these lashes are uh, being used by the users uh, for supporting the local actions. Um, and of course, what we have also noticed is that the capacity for review, analyze, and dissemination data uh, is growing within the people at the health facility. Uh, the important also part was, you know, as they meet together, share this information. Um, now, even the best practices can be now uh, elevated, more or less kind of bringing the local, the voice of the local people in terms of what practices they're doing. A good case was what we found out in one of the facilities in Bai, where the malaria uh, focal person really kind of used their da uh, the data to actually identify some of the facilities where they were uh, having high care malaria cases, uh, went there and doing intervention, and then of course used the um, follow them up to understand if these interventions are working or are not working. So um, conclusion, um, basically, we all know that data use uh, can be interpreted differently, uh, depending on different levels. If you're on the national level, your data use aspect would be different uh, compared to who are uh, the people at the facility level. Um, however, I think um, these, these district of excellence are sites. Uh, provide an environment where you know uh, um, these these practices can be really tested, can be really um, are guided, and also learning from them can be now documented and shared with the other districts for 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 a better um, or enhanced data use. Uh, the important part, which we also learned until right now, is that it's really important to build on top of local routines to facilitate and socializing of these uh, introduced interventions, so that these interventions can be sustained and scaled. Uh, throughout, of course, the use of uh, DHS2 at the facility level uh, to help our data review, analyze, and use uh, helps in terms of, um, you know, bringing these um, stakeholders or empowering these stakeholders in terms of what they are doing in terms of uh, local actions. And of course, uh, what we are seeing is that more research and effort is required in terms of anchoring these interventions within this district of excellency. And a good part, of course, a uh, good example is uh, this uh, use of denominator, uh, for health facility. I think more research needs to be done, more effort needs to be done to see how best practices can be used to scale across the country, but also finding a sustainable way uh, in a way that we can really uh, scale the solutions which we are finding in this particular uh, district of excellency. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening.
Thank you so much, Wilfred, and also to Adolf for sharing the Districts of Excellence approach. So now we're entering our uh, lightning round, where I actually challenged the next several um, speakers to give me six or seven slides. So everyone, less than 10 minutes, let's stay on time. And in fact, I will actually ask you to please just skip over your context and go just straight to our, our problem statements. Um, so our next presenter is going to be uh, Vincent Camera from the Ministry of Health Uganda, sharing around how the case-based surveillance system was actually used to improve linkage uh, to second line treatment among drug resistant cases. Oh. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I've been introduced. My name is Vincent Kamara from Uganda. I'm happy to be here. So quickly, um, to move away from uh, aggregate reporting, was informed by a number of issues we identified, especially with the quality of the information or the data that was coming through. Um, our aggregate reporting started almost in uh, 2012, uh, but we started moving towards uh, tracker-based uh, reporting especially for uh, what we call the electronic case-based surveillance system. And uh, so far we have rolled out this uh, system to 504 health facilities, and uh, that is equivalent to 28% of all the sites that we have. But most importantly, all the 18 um, multi-drug resistance sites uh, are all enrolled on the case-based surveillance. So, we have noticed that uh, we noticed that there was a lot of data management errors uh, resulting from um, unreliable and inaccurate data for patient management and decision making, uh, especially when people have to tally uh, the uh, the forms uh, manually uh, to report in aggregate reporting. Uh, they were encountering a number of issues. It was time consuming. We are not able to do real time data. Um, of course, limited and in-depth in investigations for better management on decision-making uh, were lacking when you're using the paper-based. Um, but also when you're using aggregate, we notice that if you wanted to do spatial uh, patient-level data, it would be a little bit difficult. So that's why we ended up with uh, the DHIS2 tracker, uh, which, looked at, which we dub the electronic case-based surveillance for TB and leprosy. Um, so we developed the app uh, back in uh, 2020, and um, we have trained almost 2,000 uh, health facility staff in the use of the system. Um, almost 1,400 clinicians, those are the program people. And of course, if you really want the data to be utilized, you have to encourage the, the program people to appreciate um, the tracker-based system. So to further um, help them, we also trained uh, the records uh, assistants. So we have almost 527 records assistants um, trained. And of course, the biostatisticians who help to analyze the data at district level. Uh, just to be clear that the biostats also help in the rollout of uh, the case-based surveillance system to the health facilities. So the rollout started with the DR sites. We already had a management information system with them. So having the case-based surveillance system, uh, we rolled out to the DR sites first. And then now we have scaled out to the other health center fours, hospitals and health center threes. But uh, to make this even more interesting is the routine monitoring that is done weekly, uh, especially for the data entered. Uh, in the case-based surveillance versus what has been in the, um, in, the, um, in the manual records or the hard copy reports. So just to bring uh, a little bit of uh, context to this, um, for those who know about TB uh, management, it all starts from uh, a patient coming to be screened. 
uh, once they come to the outpatient department, the OPD. So there they use the ICF guide. And from there, for patients who have been presumed, they are entered in the presumptive TB register. And at this point, this is where now the ECBSS comes in because once we send them to the lab, now the positive, those who are positive for TB and those who have rifampicin resistance are entered in the, in the case-based surveillance system. So once they are entered, there's a notification that goes to the DR site, uh, both SMS and also appear, they appear on the dashboard at the RR site. So once they have appeared there, there's a quick follow-up. Uh, it's in real time. The moment the notification comes, the TB focal person or the DRTB focal person of that site immediately um, follows up to see that this patient has um, been can be started uh, on treatment uh, immediately. So that's why I mentioned that there has always been a check between what is in the system versus what has been in the in the money records to make sure that this linkage uh, is act made actionable. So uh, periodically, uh, on a weekly basis, they have the regional TB and lip process supervisor who generate lists from the case-based surveillance uh, and always compare with the registers to make sure that we don't have uh, any missing link. And um, the integration of the of having the uh, the system together with making phone calls uh, help uh, the diagnostic treatment centers and patients to make sure that they are all initiated. And of course, once a patient is confirmed, uh, we make sure that uh, for us to to close the gap we make sure that the index TB patients and the RRs are contact traced. And all these uh, linkage, all these lists are generated from the case-based surveillance system. Uh, the system has also helped us to make appointment lists just to make sure that uh, people who have started on treatment, uh, we make sure uh, complete the treatment. So this continues, especially for the people who have been contact traced, we continue, link them for screening, screening presumption, after presumption, we start them for treatment. Uh, through uh, the different tests. So that's how the ECBSS um, helps to, uh, to bridge uh, the patient management flow. And um, just a few results of what we have seen from uh, since we started using the case-based surveillance. We had an issue of um, linkage. So uh, some patients would come to the laboratory, they would be sent to the lab, uh, to be tested. Um, some would turn out to be RRs, rifampicin resistance cases, but then somewhere, somehow would miss them to be started on treatment. And this gap has, was quite low, almost, uh, it was a big gap in um, 2021, July. So uh, once we started using the case best, we started closing on, on this gap. And uh, as of uh, the last six months uh, in 2022, we were almost closing this gap. We we're at 98%. So uh, if we looked at the ones of 2023, we have actually managed to close this gap. Uh, and this has been much really attributed to, to the case-based surveillance system. And of course, by regions, we know that regions that have improved much better than the others. And uh, we we have picked uh, peers or people who have done this very well to actually move out and um, send out a message to the others. And that's how, uh, so we can see those people that are within their 100% level, those regions, we have picked out the DR focal persons to go out and um, give these key lessons to the others. So short-term outcomes, um, we have seen, this is an excerpt of our case-based surveillance uh, system. So we've seen an increased proportion of identified patients started on treatment. The reduced time to start treatment uh, because sometimes when you let them be for a long time, you end up losing them. So the moment they are, we notice them, we're able to start them on treatment quicker. And of course, with the easy follow-up, especially with the notification module, we're able to see improved follow-up and has and thus uh, improved treatment success. So the people, who have been notified quicker, we do quick follow-up 
and we make sure that um, there is treatment success. And this treatment success is monitored better because we are the six month interim, the 12 months, and finally the 24 months. So because this is tracked in the system, we are able to know and pick out the missing, uh, the missing links. And as a, as a, at the ministry, we have seen improved health management decision-making. Uh, for example, now we are doing a shift from the, the original regimens. We, we want to have the BIPAL and the BIPALM. And of course, if, in, in the older way, we would have waited to have um, the hard copy tools printed, uh, the hard copies rolled out. But now with the case-based surveillance, we are able to add these regimens directly into the system. And the people are able to select on these uh, regimens quickly once they have been started uh, on them. And of course, improved monitoring of health programs, fast tracking patient level analysis across programs. And now we are able to improve the, the geographic uh, surveillance. And uh, also these were the six months and the 12 month interim success rate, which we are able to, to pick out. And what do we look out for? We target scale up of uh, case-based surveillance to all, to more uh, diagnostic and treatment units, integration and interoperability with other EMRs. We are lucky that uh, the HIV uh, EMR is really up to date and uh, we want to have the integration work. We also have diagnostic solutions like the lab expert. So once the, the gene expert machine picks an RR, we would want it to send the information directly to the case-based surveillance. So this interoperability option is already in the offing, and we believe it is going to lead us in the best position. And lastly, to explore how artificial intelligence uh, with machine language can be incorporated in the case-based surveillance for MDR-TB patient management. Uh, we've, I've learned a lot from uh, today's presentation earlier, and I believe it's going to be um, a magic bullet in our MDR treatment. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vincent. So our next two presenters, our final two presenters are online, um, both with uh, FHI 360, um, with various ways of using DHIS2 tracker to improve HIV um, case management. So uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Esofa Kokoloko to please go ahead and uh, share your screen. Um, whenever you're ready, let me get out here. Okay, so Asafa, I don't think I'm seeing you. Oh, okay. Okay, now we see it, Asafa. But we do not hear you. Can you try speaking? I don't think we hear you.
Okay, so we cannot hear you. I'm going to, I think it is your mic, Esofa. I think it's on your end. Okay, maybe can we switch and uh, maybe have Ulrich uh, could try it, try first and, and see if that fixes the problem. Ulrich, would you be ready to present? Good afternoon. Okay, no problem. Okay, great. So I hear you. So just to confirm, Esofa, I think the challenge is on your end. So I'm going to let Ulrich go ahead uh, to see if you can sort it out. Okay, over okay. to you, Ulrich. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good afternoon all. I'm Ulrich Katray, Monitoring and Evaluation Officer at FHI, FHI Burkina Faso. My presentation will uh, focus on the term improving patient outcomes and continuum of care through application of DHS2 tracker, a study case of the IWA project in Burkina Faso. Ending Aids in West Africa is a cooperative agreement with USN running from 2017 to 2026. The goal of the project is to achieve control of the HIV epidemic in West Africa by accelerating progress across the region towards ending health through prevention, care, and treatment, and treatment with a focus on key populations. Our objective are to improve service delivery at community and health facility level 45 viral load laboratory system and 45 monitoring and evaluation system. In Burkina Faso, EWA covers five health regions and concerns 31 health facilities and five viral load laboratories under the leadership of the National Council of Fight Against AIDS and STIs and health sector program to fight AIDS and STIs. One of the main challenges of keeping people living with HIV in the continuum of care is the major issue in achieving viral suppression, a guarantee of the quality of medical care. The inability to increase the number of patients on active ERT, despite the success of the EWA project in case detection and links to ERVs, was mainly due to difficulties in identifying missed refill appointment and treatment interruption. This, this presentation will demonstrate the positive impact of using the DH2 tracker to improve patient outcomes and ensure continuity of care. We have faced significant challenges in keeping people living with HIV in the continuum of care. The number of active patients on ERV did not increase proportionally due to difficulties in identifying those who missed their ERT refill appointment and those on treatment interruption. A patient on treatment interruption is a patient without ERV contact or withdrawal for more than 28 days since their last schedule examination ERV contact. What was the contribution of DH2 in solving this problem? The EWA project in Burkina Faso uses the electronic HIV tracking 
two DH two of uh, electronic individual management of people living with HIV on ERT. A custom DH two dashboard was developed to allow each PECFA USN supported health facility to generate an anonymous weekly list of patients with renewal appointment. Those who missed their appointment and of do and of who those who uh, were in interruption in treatment. This line list contained information that allowed each patient to be contacted by telephone to remind them of their appointment in order to reduce dropouts. Patients are contacted the day after the missed appointment. With these two capabilities enabled AWA to run a two-month return to care campaign in August, October 2020. From the result we have reached, we note that we note that. Uh, we went from a test score of 17,231 in August to 25,841 25, at the end of October. The proportion of ITT then fell from 48% to 16%. Patients who died or were transferred to other health facilities were documented in the tracker. The continuous updating of the these two list facilities, the individualized follow-up of patients, and in April 2023, the proportion of ITT within the EWA project in Burkina Faso is 2% of people living with HIV under treatment. In conclusion, we can say that the digital tracker is beneficial to EWA project. Enable timely analysis and reporting to improve continuity of treatment and return to care. It effectively identifies patients and provides the information needed to schedule appointment or organize community dispensations. Automation of the patient list was crucial to achieve the project goals. In view of these successes, the government of Burkina Faso is working to set up a national e tracker in health in all healthcare in all healthcare facilities for HIV in the country. Thank you for your attention. Okay, zone there is access, zone block. Okay. Hello. Hello, over to you. Over to me. Thank you. We hear you now. Okay, sorry. Do you hear me? I have a connection problem. We do hear you. Okay, it's good now. All good. Okay. Let me come on. So, display. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, I'm ready now. Uh, I have an honor to present uh, the abstract on topic increasing variable low uptake in eligible people living with uh, HEV clients using this two tracker in Togo. Uh, I'm Esofa Kokoloko, the regional data manager FHI Togo. I will present uh, my abstract, follow this outline. In context, I, I will remember as the, the project EWA. EWA project ending it in West Africa is founded by USSD through cooperative agreement. The goal of uh, our project is to achieve HIV epidemic control in West Africa. Specifically, project objectives are first improve service delivery in community and health facility level to strengthen the barrier load laboratory system and strengthen monitoring and evaluation system. As uh, we wish we see on a chart at the left, our project cover four health region and it's implemented in 29 health facilities and eight barrier load laboratory. Our project works under leadership at on national AIDS control program. We have the main challenge in our project is to attain various laws of press for people living with AHV. It's at three levels, this talent, pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic. Our, this presentation will show us how using of GIS2 tracker helped to address some analytic fast problem in the variable low coverage journey. What specific problem did we try to solve about? Basically, uh, MNE system had many difficulties to identify easily people living with EHV needs variable low testing because this system used paper-based and manual practice. This system could, couldn't, easy, couldn't support estimates eligible patients for variable low tests, hydrogen planning. Uh, clients of unaware of uh, variable low testing program and paper-based reminder are difficult. And MNE system lacked sample collection scheduling, resulting in client present at the wrong clinic time and leading to delayed barrier load tests. How did we use this to address this challenge? As well, health organization and national aid control program recommend, we can generate the variable load testing date, eligibility date for each patient uh, with using this tracker in, uh, our, uh, our, in our project. When we enter, when we enter ARV events in this we directly show the first and the second variable load eligibility date for new patients. For other patients, we display the routine and target eligible dates when we enter variable load sampling events. In terms of uh, utilization, we use this to display recent events and ensure availability of individual information. We created 
dashboard to show the number and the list of eligible patients for varial low tests within a specific period. We implemented a process where site data managers extracted a list of eligible patients. And uh, we also matched information on outgoing appointment with the healthcare provider in charge of these patients. We provided the list of eligible patients at the beginning of each month, month and enable healthcare providers to take monthly action based on the information. What analysis tools did we introduce? PEFA USAID found project EWA in Togo improve varial load testing performance and demand. First, dish tracker generates accurate, help us to generate accurate list of eligible patients for varial load tests, adding in demand assessments on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. They, by using dish tracker, varial load eligible dates and the patient's contact detail is used by health care healthcare provider to optimize communication and uh, ensure timely provision to varial load test services. And at the last blood sample for 29 PEPFA supported sites are sent two times in at in week. Most important result we obtain using dish tracker in Togo is for January to December 2022. Sites which use dish tracker had sampled and tested 97% of eligible patients, and 95% of those tested achieved varial low suppress. When we compare this result to sites without dish tracker, only 56% of eligible patients were found and tested, and 88% uh, of those uh, were tested achieved var variable, variable suppress. Due to this positive outcome, the National AIDS Control Program has recently expanded the impl implementation of dish tracker to 50 non pepfa USAID supported site in Togo. In conclusion, we can say the, the varial load testing is a, a crucial measure of a success antiretroviral therapy and DHS2 give us an opportunity to, to increase demand of uh, varial load to people, patients, patients who need uh, tests. Utilization, using the dish tracker in uh, this step, initial step on the varial load testing process is important because it, it permits us to is easily identify eligible clients, to track missing appointments, and to align barrier load collection date to ARV refill, antiretroviral refill data for patients. The adoption of dish tracker at treatment facility 
has the potential to significantly enhance demand for viral tests in our country. Finally, we can say, based on the promised results achieved in PEPFAR USIG supported sites, scaling out this tracker to all facility appears to be worthwhile investment for the government. Thank you for your kind attention. attention. Thank you so much, Asifa. That was super impressive. I know that we have a lot of um, software team, tracker team, implementers that are going to be so excited to hear about how these features like working lists and e-registries actually help um, patients to achieve their viral load testing, to reach their targets and achieve care. So thank you all for your patience with this session. We really appreciate it. Um, we will close here and any questions, I think we can find other presenters in the hallways this week. So have a good rest of your evening.